I'm sure at some point in your Planned Parenthood, your heart has been so filled with love for your plants that you have dared to think, can plants be my full-time job? How hard is it to be in horticulture? Can I monetize my passion for plants? Well, my plant friend, the answer is yes. There is a whole world waiting for you in the horticulture industry should you choose that path in your life, way beyond just being a plant fluencer or a planty podcaster like I am. Should you desire your full-time job can be literally playing with plants all day, (laughs) but realistically, so many more opportunities beyond that. And today we are going to dive in and discuss nine different options for you to make your dream of working with plants full-time come true. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. Self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, my plant friend. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm so happy that you are here, returning to the show, listening, being a part of the community. It means so much. I hope the content has been helping you grow more joy in your life. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Maria. I'm your new plant friend, and I'm the host of this podcast, and it's my goal to help you care for plants and grow more joy. I'm so excited for today's episode, and it was a long one. I want to dive right in. But as we are in the holiday mode, if you're looking for an easy gift for a friend for the holidays this year, try my book. I think my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, could be a great option. If you don't know, it's my self-help book that I wrote. It's all about how to use plant care as self-care, whether you're a gardener, whether you're a outdoor gardener or indoor plant parent, the book really has something for everyone. And I wrote it as a love letter to plants and a way for you to deepen your relationship with plants. It would make a great gift on its own. It would make a great gift with a plant or with another planty accessory. Anyway, today's podcast, I'm talking with Daniel Fuller, who is actually another podcast host. He hosts the Plants Grow Here podcast, which is a planty podcast, but it focuses on supporting horticulture industry folk where this podcast supports mostly plant enthusiasts. This conversation was mind-opening for all sorts of different ways because I didn't realize how many different opportunities there are for you to get into the horticulture field. Daniel is going to run us through an article he wrote on nine different ways that you can get into horticulture and make it your job, but just wanted to make a note. Daniel is Australian. You're going to tell by his incredible accent. So this conversation is more of a high-level chat because honestly, we have listeners from this podcast all over the world. So if you get excited about one of the nine options, you might have to do a little bit of Googling. Daniel's obviously going to mention the Australian organizations that support the horticulture industry. You might have to give a Google if you're in Europe or if you're in Asia or if you're obviously in the United States or Canada. But it's a high-level, wonderful conversation that is going to give you so much inspiration to get on your Google and start exploring. And if you're interested in getting into the horticulture industry, you should definitely go check out Daniel's podcast. It's called Plants Grow Here. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Welcome to Growing Joy, Dan. All the way, you are literally in a different day right now. It's Tuesday for you, (laughs) and it's Monday for me as we're recording this because you're in Australia. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I got up nice and early for you. Don't worry, Maria. Yeah, I guess good morning to you as I'm recording this in the evening. I'm so excited to chat with you today because I get this question a lot. You know, how do I make plants my job? How can I do plants full time? And you're a great person to talk to about this because all you do is serve the horticulture industry in Australia. So before we dive into the top 10 ways that you can get involved in plants professionally, can you introduce yourself to the audience and share how you've built the career in horticulture that you have right now? Sure. So I am a national council member for the Australian Institute of Horticulture. I run the Plants Grow Here podcast. I do a bunch of writing for a few different publications, including my careers column for the Australian Hort Journal. I am winning an award for horticulture media this year. But really where I've built my career is as a maintenance gardener of 10 years. So I am the guy who looks after the garden for the next 10 years after someone else designs it and then someone else constructs it. So it gives me a bit of a perspective on the plants that a lot of other people don't get to see. 
say you're working in a nursery or, you know, as a landscape architect or a landscape construction professional, I have seen the best designs and the best looking designs absolutely turn bad because they just didn't have an understanding of how the soil works, of how the plants work together over the next decade. So that's really where I've spent most of my time. And now I help people get into the industry for a job. So whether that's through my careers column with the journal, whether that's with my work with the Australian Institute of Horticulture, speaking with students, or it's through my job board where I'm helping people find the best jobs in the industry with some of the best companies that I know. That's really my passion is helping people find a job in this beautiful industry. And how did you get into it? How did you get that first job in horticulture? What was the motivation there? Well, I was working in sales, working business to business. I've been working with Telstra, which is our big communications facilitator in Australia. I worked for Fuji Xerox as well, selling printer contracts for businesses. And it was just so stressful, Maria. Like I really got to the point where I was banging my head against a brick wall and just needed to get out. So it was more of a push motivation than a pull motivation. So, you know, my buddy was a landscaper and he said, oh, no worries, I'll turn all my landscape clients into landscape maintenance clients. That didn't really work out. I'd given my two weeks notice and then turned up to his work site. And then he said, sorry, mate, work's not there. You need to go and find another job. But by then, I'd already been hooked on the idea of working with plants because he'd explained to me the therapeutic benefits of working with plants. So I went and found another job. And yeah, it just really went from there. The first six weeks of holding a whippersnipper or a brush cutter My hands were vibrating and, you know, they just couldn't stop just from the physical exertion of that task. And I was dreaming about whippersnipping and that's sort of the process (laughs) you have to go through, making all the straight lines every night and every day. But um, yeah, it's a bit of a baptism by fire in a way because, yeah, these are heavy machines. And if you're used to typing at a desk, it's a very different kind of a role. But I found that I was able to feel the breeze on my face. I was able to listen to the birds. I was able to work with my body instead of my brain. And that was really what I needed at that time. And in terms of education, what education did you have when you went into maintenance? And have you gotten any other extra education since then? Like, did you end up getting a degree in horticulture eventually? So in Australia, I'm not sure what it's like overseas. And so I don't have expertise in terms of like what qualifications you need to get a job over in the US. But in Australia, for To become a maintenance gardener, you don't need any experience and you don't need any qualifications. You can really just come in under minimum wage. So that's what I did. I just came in unskilled, just found a job, was underpaid. And then I worked my way up through the ranks and, you know, kept getting promoted to team leader at everywhere I went. And then you, that's where the better pay starts to come in. It's not usually great pay. It's not a lot better than when you're working under someone who's a team leader, when you become a team leader. But then you can look to becoming a manager. And that's really where qualifications are going to probably be more beneficial. Either a team leader or manager uh, role, they usually want you to have a qualification. So I ended up getting my own diploma in horticulture. So in Australia, most people in the field don't have a degree. We either have a certificate three or a diploma. So that's like a tertiary education. It's after high school. It's like a trade qualification. We call it TAFE over here. Yeah, similar to like, at least I know here, I've taken a lot of classes at the New York Botanical Garden and they have like certificate programs that you can get in horticulture in sustainable garden design or horticultural therapy or all sorts of stuff. So that's cool though. So you kind of threw yourself in the deep end, baptism by fire, getting the job with not a lot of experience and then worked your way up and then continued to kind of empower yourself through further education with that diploma. I love that you're the job guy. You're the horticulture job guy in Australia. So you're the perfect person to talk to. You wrote this great paper that's, you know, 10 ways to get involved in the horticulture industry. So I want to kind of just grill you about all the opportunities for, you know, thinking about the hobbyist, the plant enthusiast that's listening to this, probably in a very similar position that you were, you know, at a job that was not fulfilling them has recognized their passion for plants, Have has recognized that they want to be in nature more, they want to spend more time in nature, and that the easiest way to do that is to start your job there. So what's the lowest hanging fruit in terms of how can I immediately transition into the horticulture industry and start getting that experience? In Australia, there are a bunch of different low-hanging fruits that we can talk about. I think Maintenance is one, get into maintenance. You know, people are begging for 
stuff. Like it's not that hard to get a maintenance job. Just Google search lawn care, garden care, garden maintenance, it's just stuff like that. You can also get into retail nurseries, production nurseries. You can be a truck driver if you have that kind of experience. Let's talk about retail because I love the idea of getting into retail, especially if you're someone who's like, I want to try horticulture. I want to see if this is the right fit for me. Leslie Halleck, who is a horticulturist in the States, who's a really good friend of mine, she's had every job in the horticulture industry, you know, over the last couple of decades. She says that retail is a fabulous way to kind of cut your teeth in the industry because you're exposed to so many different plants. You have to learn about them so quickly. And it's like, it's a very quick pace that you've got to just kind of learn and catch up. So can you speak a little bit to being in the retail space of the horticulture industry? I think retail is, is a great place to enter. It's glamorous. It's, you know, it's, you don't have to get too dirty most of the time. You're not having to lift heavy machinery. It's a really great place to start for a lot of people. The downside is it's another baptism by fire. So you're not going to be able to escape uh, that baptism by fire, no matter which area you get into, because you're going to need to know a lot of stuff and you're going to need to know really quickly. People are going to bring in their plants to you and they're going to say, hey, what's wrong with this plant? So you're going to need to know and you're going to need to ask the people who you're working with how to troubleshoot that. Or maybe it's even a case of just passing them off to someone who knows better and just sitting around and listening to them so that you can gain those skills for yourself. Because, yeah, uh, you know, it's a servant role. When you're serving people these retail plants, you're helping them find the right plant for them, for their home. They might have a few questions for you and say, hey, this is my house this is what I like. And then you might be able to point them to a plant that they'd never even heard of. That's one of your favorites that then they get to, you know, welcome into their own home. And maybe they wouldn't have found that plant if it wasn't for you. So it sounds like if you have people skills, retail is good. If you don't have people skills, if you're, if you don't want to be listening to a lot of people, if you don't want to almost be triaging for people, there's like a therapy aspect of it. Like, these are my problems. This is what I need. Or, you know, my plant's not doing well. And so you're going to have to deal with unhappy customers as well. So it sounds like if you don't have experience and you're a people person, retail forward facing is a great option. What's the option for someone who maybe doesn't want to be interacting, doesn't want that baptism by fire, the overwhelm of maybe not knowing the answers, having to talk to, you know, sometimes 100 people a day, what would that entry level job be? So I'm going to say probably either domestic or public parks and garden maintenance. So if you're working in a public garden, you're rarely ever going to see anyone unless you're working in a really nice garden that's like a bit fancy, like botanic gardens can sometimes have people coming up and asking you, hey, what's this plant? What's this? What's that? But if you're just working on like sports ovals and stuff like that, no one's ever probably going to talk to you. So I'd get into a role like that. Now, there's going to be some hard work involved, but what, you know, at least it's physical hard work and it's not mental hard work where you're stressing. It's just work that's going to make your arms sore and your legs sore and it's going to keep you fit. It's a good kind of hard work. If you don't have experience, like when you started maintenance, like how are you learning? How are you learning how to prune? How are you learning how to do all these things? Okay, so when I started, the guy handed me a whippersnipper and he said, go and whippersnip that. And I had to figure it out for myself. So, you know, I I over-exaggerate that. You know, I'd come to him and I'd say, what do you do when you do this? What do you do when you do that? There's going to be a bunch of different questions that kind of come up as you reach one level. You're going to have the questions to reach the next level, to reach the next level. Usually they're going to put you on a simple task. So it'll be, go and whippersnip that. Come back and tell me if you have any problems. Maybe it's just pushing the mower. A lot of people start on the mower. It's very easy just to run up and down and do your lines. And then as you work with the team, you sort of start to take on things by osmosis. So it'll start out with you just go and mow and and that's all you see. Then suddenly you'll realize, why does the whippersnipper go clockwise around this part of the garden and go anti-clockwise around that part? So the reason why they go anti-clockwise around some parts is because they're trying to push the debris out away from the lawn after you've already mown. Whereas before you mow, they're going to go anti-clockwise and spit the stuff onto the lawn so that you can mow it up and chew it up. So there's just a lot of different little tricks you're going to learn as you go along. That's so interesting and kind of sounds like what you make of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you can teach anybody the skills, but you have to hire for attitude is what a lot of employers are saying. So once you find the right person, then you you sort of throw all of your wisdom into that person. 
Yeah, well, and I guess that may, on the other side, for being hireable, it sounds like demonstrating a positive attitude, demonstrating can do, demonstrating desire to learn and move up the ranks and do a good job is really important in those interviews and in those initial couple of months. Yeah, exactly right. Just show that you're not going to turn up on time every day. So you want to turn up on time for the interview. You don't want to ghost your interviewer. Other than that, like really the the bar has been lowered because we've got a staff shortage crisis. And I know it's in the US too. It's not just in Australia. Make sure your houseplants don't suffer this winter with Soltec plant friends. As December unfolds, sometimes those shorter days can challenge even the most dedicated plant lover. But with Soltec's lineup of incredible grow lights, the Aspect, the Vita, the Highland, and the Grove, they have a lighting solution for you and your plants' needs and your home. So here are the different options that they have. First up, they have the Aspect. This is kind of the light they're the most famous for. I have three of them. It's the pendant style LED grow light that hangs from your ceiling. It's super sleek. You can get it in black or white and it seamlessly folds into your home decor while giving your plants that full spectrum of light that they need to thrive. Then they have the Vita Grow Bulb. So this is a comforting warm light. It's a light bulb that you literally can just screw into any light fixture. You can turn any desk lamp or floor lamp that you have into a highlight haven for plants. And the Vita smoothly syncs with dimmable setups and smart systems. If you want like an epic option, you can go for their Highland, which is their track lighting system. It's used for so many very famous green spaces that you know, but it's still affordable and easily installed in your home. And last but not least, the Grove, their new grow bar. I just installed three in my office under a bookshelf that I have. If you've wanted to have an Ikea grow house or turn a bookshelf into a highlight haven like I did, or maybe put some grow lights under a kitchen cabinet to grow herbs. The Grove is such a great opportunity. It's dimmable. It comes with a timer and it looks like any other light you'd ever have in your home. So capture that summer light all year long. Soltech has a promise. Happy plants, happy you. As a listener, you get 15% off with the code BLOOM15. Once again, that's code BLOOM15 for 15% off at soltech.com. Holiday shopping is here, plant friends, and what better gift to give someone you love than a personalized Wind River wind chime. Plus, you don't need to leave the house while you shop. Wind River chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, personalized gift straight to your door. When you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout with them at windriverchimes.com, you can get a free engraving on any of engravable wind chimes, so you can personalize it for your loved one with a special saying, a memorable date, or a name. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering high-quality wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, restful environment. We have two of them at our house. We are obsessed with them. Mama Fiella recently visited my house to take care of me after my surgery. She would not stop talking about the chime, and when she left, specifically requested one for Christmas for her house in Florida because she could not get over how amazing it sounded versus the other chimes that she already has. And hey, the holidays are stressful, and Wind River Chimes are really relaxing to listen to. So maybe you get one as a gift or maybe you just get one for yourself. A Wind River Chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they're going to think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. Use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com. Get a free engraving on any of the engravable chimes. That's windriverchimes.com and code GROWINGJOY at checkout for your free engraving. No, definitely. It's really hard to find good workers. So, okay. So we talked about retail. We talked about maintenance. What's the next cool, fun area of horticulture people might be interested? Now, this is provided probably that you're going to need to get a little bit of education before you can enter. Okay. So with the nurseries, there are three types of nurseries. There's the retail one that we talked about, but they're not usually the ones who start the plants off. So they're often buying their plants from a wholesale nursery or even a plant breeder sometimes so that they can then sell those plants. Sorry, they buy from a production nursery, not a, not a breeder. So a plant breeder, it's kind of like a copywriting system in terms of, do you guys have Hass avocados over there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Hass avocado was owned by somebody in terms of intellectual property. So someone spent decades and decades and decades breeding the perfect avocado 
And then if they didn't get paid for every avocado, that would be like 30 years completely wasted because someone else would just come and propagate it and then sell their plant. And then we'd be stuck with the original avocado that no one really wants to eat. So plant breeders' rights allow plants to be sold in a number of different ways. So then there'll be a production nursery who has the rights to produce those plants and then sell them on. So a production nursery is often also a wholesale nursery, but not often a retail nursery. So sometimes you have a middleman, which is just the wholesale nursery between the plant production nursery and the retail nursery. So there's really a bunch of different ways you can get into the nursery game in terms of like, do I want to be forward facing? Do I want to be in the back room just propagating plants? And then if you really do well at that, then you can become a plant breeder and then become that person who breeds that has avocado or the next best plant that everybody wants to use. So those are some pretty good places to start thinking about getting into and heading towards in the nursery sector of the horticulture industry. Wow. So if I'm hired in the nursery in the back of the room to take propagations, do I need a degree for that or a certificate for that? Or that's another thing where people will just teach me how to do it? In Australia, we love to have a Cert 3. You don't need to have a formal qualification though. So a lot of the time, you know, once you know how to stick a prop into the potting mix and you know how to pot up, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. It's just repetitive work. It's kind of like being in McDonald's in terms of just like flipping the burger and then passing it on. It's a lot of work, but it can be rather repetitive. And there's also the factor that artificial intelligence and machinery are coming into the industry and they're probably going to disrupt some of those entry level roles in terms of that repetitive work. So that's something to think about too. Okay. So let's talk about breeding because I feel like that could be a really fun area to get into. It's a very fun area. You probably want to be established because if you want to breed plants, there's a bit of a lag term for, you know, getting paid for it. Unless you're working for a big breeder, some of those big breeders will hire people to just breed. They're probably going to have quite a few qualifications, even a PhD sometimes, and a lot of experience with plants. That's not an entry level role, but it's a role to get into the industry and look forward to doing it. Because you can see plants that you've bred all throughout your neighborhood, all throughout the country, depending on how good a breeder you are. Like, can you breed something that works well in frost, in tropical climates, with wet feet and with drought? Like, if you can create a plant that's like that, you're going to see, and, it, and if it looks beautiful as well, you're going to see it absolutely everywhere as long as you can get the plant breeder's rights done. Because that can be quite tricky too. Like, that's a massive barrier. It's not easy especially in Australia, to get your plant breeder's rights done and then help those plants get onto the market. You might need help with that. So you might breed the plant and then come to another recognized company who can breed plants and say, look, this is my plant, but I want you to distribute it. Mm, Interesting. I know we have a whole episode for people who are interested in what we're talking about, trademarking your plants, getting the rights for the IP of your plants. We have a episode far back in my feed about plant law, basically, which talks about this. So if you're interested in the details of that, go listen to that episode because it's nuanced and a lot of words that I don't understand. So plant breeding. So you've got to get degrees for plant breeding, probably in botany or biology or something, because you have to understand like plant genetics. But then it's really fun to figure out how to breed those plants. I know one of our sponsors, LeafJoy, like in the houseplant industry, a big complaint is that ficus always drop their leaves. So like people spend $300 on a fiddly fig and then all the leaves drop. And like they've bred this line of ficus that is more resistant to dropping its leaves, which is kind of wild to me to think about, but also a pain point for a lot of houseplant owners, you know? So I think that's so cool even just to think about, okay, how can I make this plant better? How can I make this plant more evolved? Or how can I take these two plants that I love and cross them and make something cool? Like that's just so fun. Yeah. And a lot of plants will die in the process because you're going to get a lot of ones that just aren't up to scratch. Right. Yes, that's (laughs) true. You need the stomach. You need the stomach for a lot of dead plants in your wake. Yes. So what's the difference between breeding and production? Great question, because there's a bit of nuance here, but they are very different. So let's say I work in uh, content creation for a company called Ausbreed. Now, they're one of the biggest Australian native plant breeders in the country. Now, they don't sell plants. They breed them and then they hold the copyright on them. So let's say Slim Callistamine is a bottle brush. I'm not sure if you know that plant over there, bottle brushes. 
it's like you're speaking a different language to me okay, right now. Okay, okay. Well, they're, <laughs> they're an Australian native plant that's related to eucalypts. But imagine if all of those eucalypt flowers were on a single stem all close together and they look like a bottle brush. Okay. Oh, like a brush for a bottle. Okay, yeah. I got it. Okay. Yeah. That's what they look like. They have the, um, similar sort of smelling leaves, oily, beautiful plants. They work really well as a hedge. So slim calistamin is a plant that can grow up to three meters tall and it only grows to about, I think, a meter wide or something. It's really columnar. Now, it's been really good in wet feet. They've experienced flooding and it just keeps smashing it. Drought. So if you can have a plant that can be exposed to periodic wet feet and drought, then it's going to be a really good plant. So now we have this plant that's awesome. Now we need to sell it. Well, they're not going to focus on selling it because they're still working on the next load of plants that are coming out that are going to be the ones that come out in 5, 10, 15 years. So they get what they call a propagation nursery who can work with their system of copywriting and pay per plant that they sell. So that propagation nursery is going to keep propagating plants and then they're going to sell those plants that they propagate either to a wholesale or a retail nursery. Now, that wholesale or retail nursery then keep on selling those plants until eventually they get in the garden. So it's not like you have a nursery that's breeding plants, propagating them, and then selling them to the public. There are a bunch of different steps in this process. Does that make sense? It does. And I just want to encourage people listening, if you're confused, this is a big aha moment, or this has been a very big aha moment for me as a consumer, as a plant consumer, how many different hands the plant goes through in order to get to our bookshelves, windowsills, coffee tables. Like, I think when you're a consumer and you don't know the industry, you think that exactly what you just said, well, this company that I, you know, my local nursery grows the plants and sells the plants and pots, you know, and you don't realize how many different places and upsells and, you know, the whole line that that plant goes through. I started speaking at national gardening conferences about my listeners, um, like about the plant consumer and being at these horticultural conferences, like my mind has been blown understanding all of the different, even just like a plant broker, like just someone who all they do is just like sells plants from, you know, one nursery to one plant shop. It's just, it's fascinating to me. So don't worry, plant friends, if you're listening and you're a little confused, but it sounds like the production is the next step. So there are the breeders who are literally developing the plant tissue. They're literally crossbreeding. They're literally propagating, finding that perfect plant. And then to sell that plant at large scale, it needs to go into production to be multiplied and sold. You got to go from that one perfect you know, baby hybrid that you created to sometimes hundreds of thousands that are going to get distributed, you know, all over the country. So production is where that is. It's more producing the plant at a larger scale. That's right. And we're talking about cloning here too. We should mention you can't breed a plant by flower and get the same exact plant. You actually have to cut, you, you know, use cuttings, which is a type of propagation where you trim the stem and you put a bit of rooting hormone on it and then you plop it in some potting mix. Now, maybe it's done through cloning. A lot of plants are. And then there's also the more complex method of tissue culture. So that's just a fancy way of doing cuttings on a scale that you can't really just do without like microscopes and scalpels and stuff like that. It's the same thing, just on a much smaller scale where you're taking a smaller sample, where you've got the stem cells that you can grow a new plant from. Got it. All right. So we covered plant breeding. We covered production. We covered retail, so because that's kind of like the plant's journey. Let's go back to what you were talking about in your journey. Landscape, outside, you said there's someone who comes up with the design and there's someone who executes the build out and then there's someone who maintains. So can you talk about those different phases? Okay, in Australia, we have what we call garden designers or landscape designers and landscape architects. We have those here too. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. So a garden designer is not a landscape architect, but a landscape architect is a type of garden designer. In Australia, a landscape architect needs at least a formal qualification or a bachelor degree, and they also need to be a member of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, or AILA. So, you know, this is someone who has quite a prestigious role. They're highly qualified, a lot more highly qualified than me, and they... They're a member of this organization, so they're they're an official landscape architect. 
Whereas anyone can wake up tomorrow and say, well, I'm a garden designer now. Right. So maybe you know what you're doing and maybe you don't. A lot of the best landscape designers have had experience either in construction or in maintenance because they've really seen what those plants look like after the design's been built. But not all of them. Some of the some great designers have never stepped foot in a garden before, um, you know, before they started designing. Maybe it's just a process of learning through research and, you know, everyone's journey is going to be different. So that's the design aspect. So is the difference between a landscape designer and a landscape architect literally the certifications and the, like, do they do the same thing? What's their day to day? Thank you to our longtime supporter, Espoma Organic. Espoma is a family owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. I can't believe it, plant friends, but we're already entering seed starting season. I highly recommend Espoma seed starting mix. I've used it for multiple garden seasons to great success. A tip that I've learned about using the seed starting mix or any seed starting mix through trial and error is to pre-moisten the soil before you plant the seeds. So don't put the soil in your little pods, put the seeds in and then water. Add the water to the mix first, put them in and then put the seeds in because sometimes as you water, the seeds will float up to the top of the water line and your the beautiful spacing that you did for your seeds will be completely askew. <laughs> then once your seeds have started, you can use their Biotone Starter Plus and their potting mix to pot those suckers up. And whether you're planting indoors and outdoors, they have a fertilizer and a potting mix or soil or compost for you from their Biotone Starter, their line of plant tones, which is their line of organic fertilizers and their extensive line of potting mixes and garden soils for whatever way you garden. To learn more about their organic indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Espoma Amazon storefront to order my favorites online. They do the same thing in terms of, you know, like a piece of krill in the ocean and a whale do the same thing. It's like, yeah, they both breathe and they both eat and they both, but at the end of the day, a whale is just a lot more complex, if that makes sense. So I think a landscape architect is operating on a level that a garden designer probably doesn't even have the understanding to understand what's going on. So they're probably using very complex CAD programs. They probably have an interest in town planning if they're designing public gardens. Whereas a garden designer can just wake up and be like, oh, I feel like doing this today. And there's absolutely, like I say that in a joking tone, like there's absolutely no judgment there. One is not better than the other. It's just that a landscape architect is a lot more complex and a lot more... Qualified. A lot more qualified, yeah. And a lot more pressure too. Yeah. But essentially they're given a blank space and said, put a garden here or make a landscape here. And then it's their job to come up with a design and come up with a selection of plants that get implemented in that design. It sounds like yes. the, the architect has fancier equipment to make the design <laughs> and has maybe more of a knowledge of the native plants versus the, you know what I mean? And maybe they can do interesting things with the leveling of the, the tiering of the land, maybe that yeah. a basic garden designer wouldn't know. But the job that they're hired for essentially in the bare bones is this is a blank space, design it. That's absolutely correct. And then they're not necessarily planting it. Someone else is doing that. It depends. So if you're working for a landscaping company, sometimes the designer is the boss and they'll also come and help with the design, with the landscaping. But not always. Yeah, you, they're two separate roles, technically. Yeah. So if you're getting hired as a garden designer, you can be making the design and then planting it up. Yeah, that's right. And also you have to remember, it's not just about planting the plants. It's also about the hardscapes. So I'm guessing in America, it's the same thing. But in Australia, we have a lot of like laws around construction and um, how tall retaining walls have to be on a certain type of slope, all these sorts of things. So a landscape architect is going to definitely know all of those town planning rules. A garden designer is probably going to know those rules, especially if they're a landscape construction professional as well, because it comes in both sides. So like, let's say if I put in a pool tomorrow and I don't put a pool fence around it, I'm opening myself up for serious litigation if a child drowns or if the site gets audited by somebody. Like it can get quite deep if you don't understand what you're doing. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, got it. So ideally, if that's something you want to do, if you want to be a designer, 
I mean, it's in your best interest to go get a degree because the other thing is you get hired to design something, you choose all the wrong plants, you know, you get hired to design a uh, a low light area and you put all highlight loving plants and those plants are all dead, you know, six weeks into it, you're going to get asked for a refund. So do your due diligence. I know, I mean, I just know personally, the New York Botanical Garden has landscape design and they have different subsects of it. So like you could be a sustainable landscape designer, you could be a all sorts of different types of certifications that they give. That's super interesting. So, and then you hire a maintenance person, whether in that same firm or someone like you or some random person that's going to come and keep up the design in its integrity. That's right. And I like you use the word integrity because I follow uh, Crimes Against Horticulture on Facebook. Ah, okay. That's a brilliant, brilliant page for everyone to follow. So Billy, I've interviewed him. He's the creator and he's just got such a great sense of humor. He really loves his plants and he wishes that everybody had the same level of love that he does for them. So you'll see stuff like plants that should have been let express their full beauty and their full natural shape, just hedge pruned into stuff like hockey pucks and all sorts of hilarious. He always comes up with an analogy like one of them was the, do you remember the Monty Python had a skit about the Academy of Weird Walks or something like that? Just walking mm-hmm. weirdly. Anyway, okay. some people pick up that uh, reference. Anyway, he had these hedges that looked like it and it was just so spot on. It was just absolutely hilarious. I've got to go join that Facebook group. <laughs> You'll learn what not to do, basically. That's so good. We'll link to it in the show notes in case anyone else is inspired to join it. What about landscape construction? Because that's kind of another side of this. Landscape construction often get paid a lot better than maintenance crews over here. You can be a laborer on the site, sure. But if you want to call yourself a landscaper, that's really where a qualification comes in, uh, especially an apprenticeship or even a Cert 3 in Australia or a diploma. Yeah, so you've got two different aspects of the built landscape. You've got soft landscape elements, which are like your organic stuff. So your plants, your mulch, that stuff, even a maintenance person will often do that, like top up your mulch or top up your pebbles or put a new plant in here and there after something's died. But the hardscapes is really where the, the rubber meets the road in terms of landscape. So the concreting, the tiling, the building of a pergola, All this stuff, it takes a lot of knowledge to do it. And not anyone can just walk up and then build those things. So it's a lot of hard work. It's a definite skill. Is that irrigation as well? Irrigation. That's exactly right. So any of these things, you could talk about these, like you could study these, any of these aspects for a really long time. But then when you throw on the horticultural knowledge too, so am I planting this too deeply? Am I planting it not deep enough? Is the soil too hard? Do we need to break it up with some gypsum? Is it hydrophobic? Do we need to break down the waxes? So all these are terms, if you don't know what they mean, it just means you've probably got a little bit longer to go before you're ready to step into a role like that, if that makes sense. And like we've kind of been saying with every with every job, I mean, the apprenticeship or getting hired in the lowest level to kind of work your way up and get a sense of, is this something I want to do before committing to paying for a certificate or, a you know, a whole degree in something probably makes sense too. 150%. Work as a laborer first. Just come on as, you know, unskilled labor. Have a go. Try a hand at it. See if you even like it. See if you like the type of people who work in the industry or do you need to find a different company? And there's just so much nuance behind it, isn't there? Yeah, so much. What about leadership, supervision, and management? That was another one that you listed completely separately. So why do you choose to list that separately? There are about a million different ways that I could break this up. So you said that there were the plant, um, what are they, the plant negotiator? What was that role that you said earlier? Broker, plant broker. The plant broker. Yeah. So you've got all different types of roles once you get into a nursery. So it's like you don't have a job as a production nursery worker. It's an oversimplification. There's the manager, there's the plant broker. So in, in the built landscape for parks and gardens, we've got like people who just work on tenders, just trying to win more work for the company. So I I chose to put leadership and management as a separate thing because it's another pathway that you can get to in pretty much any of the sectors that we've talked about, but it is a career pathway that I think a lot of people do really well at. So it's a way to increase your pay. It's something to look forward to in your career. 
it can be incredibly rewarding when you've got your team who are just performing really, really well and everyone's being taken care of. Leadership is another act of service. I think a lot of people think, I'm the leader now, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, you guys got to do what I say, blah, blah, blah. And those are always the worst leaders. The best leaders are the ones who take a servant mindset. So they're like making sure that everyone's eaten before that they have their food. Yes. It's a great book. That's a whole management book. Leaders eat last or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simon Sinek. (laughs) So that's the mentality you need to have if you want to be successful in it. If you just want to be the leader and you just want to be the big shot, um, leadership's not for you. I'm sorry. You need to go and find something else because you're going to take out those projections that you have on the staff who you're responsible for. Like you're supposed to be making these people's lives easier, not harder. I think too, it goes to say like, there's a whole section on leadership management in the bookstore and the library for a reason. Like it's a whole different skill set. I'm learning that as I grow my business and take on, you know, contractors and employees. Like it's a whole different skill set. And to be in the management of a horticultural horticulture industry, you've got to understand the plants. Like you've got to understand the product that you're managing the people about around. And you have to know how to be a good manager. So I do think management is a little bit easier to learn how to do because there's so many $20 books available that you can kind of read and apply to your management approach. You know, you don't have to get like a degree in management in order to be a manager, but it definitely takes a lot of time and intention and investment of, of your time in order to be really good at it. I think that's right. Anyone can be a manager, but not anyone can be a good manager. A good manager. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And I'd also like to separate the terms management and leadership. Management is like, it feels like daycare, you know, like you're just making sure everyone ticks all the boxes and everyone does exactly what you say. Whereas leadership is it's, um, I hesitate to use the word spiritual, but it's an interconnected thing where you're acting as a servant by showing the way. It's like you're just a part of the organism that is a company, if that makes sense. And there are different levels to it too. So you can be a team leader who's just running the ute, which is Australian slang for what you guys would call a truck. It's a utility vehicle. Or you can be the manager looking after the whole depot, or you can be the CEO looking over a bunch of different uh, branches of the company in different states and different territories. Yeah. And leadership also, I think, has an aspect of visionary, you know, being the visionary, like looking towards the future in addition to managing the day to day. Particularly when you get up into the upper levels, I find in some of the companies like in a leader, sometimes being a visionary isn't what's looked for in some of the companies where they're just trying to crank out the same result again and again and again and again. It's like sometimes what they're looking for is someone who can make sure that the right boxes are ticked. So we we covered X amount of square meters today. That's how many we need to cover every day. Good work, everyone. High five. Joey, how's your wife going? Is is everything okay with that? Or do you need to take another day off tomorrow? Ben, how's your mental health going today? How are you going on that mental health plan? Have you filled it in today? You know, Sandra, do you need those gloves? I know that I saw you wearing a ripped pair of gloves. That's not safe. Here, take these instead. Totally. I love that. And the other interesting thing, too, is management leadership. As you get farther and farther out, you're also getting your hands farther and farther out of the dirt, literally, the higher up in the company. And if you come into horticulture to be interacting with plants and dirt on a daily basis, that's also something to think about. Like the farther up the ladder you climb, the less you're probably like pruning the plants, you know, because you're managing the people who prune the plants. So that's another interesting thing to think about. It's exactly what you said. They're two different jobs. The leadership and the -the on-the-ground work, they are two different jobs. And sometimes the best leaders were the worst ones on the tool. And then everyone's sitting around going, why don't they promote that person? But it's because they're the best person for that job. And then what about sales? Because talk about being really out of the dirt. Like you could be selling plants and never even interacting with them at all. Um, What about sales? For someone who might have a sales skill set, Maybe you're doing sales for a tech company. Maybe you're doing sales the way you were doing and uh, you just want to transition and sell plants. How, how would that work? Well, it's never going to work for me because I hate sales. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for a lot of people, it's really good. So I've worked with a lot of people who are getting into their late 50s, early 60s, even up to 70, who are still working in, on the tools and their bodies are starting to break down. 
I've also seen people working in sales who used to work in the industry, never done a sales role before, but they take all of that knowledge of the industry and then they say, I'm done with being on the tools. My body's sore. I don't want to have to get up at six o'clock every morning anymore or five, four o'clock every morning anymore. I just want to go to a desk job, but there's no desk jobs that I can go to, or maybe I want to earn more money, but there's no way for me to go back to uni or TAFE and learn another a new skill set. But what they can do is they can take that industry knowledge and then start selling to other industry professionals. So I've interviewed people like Bruce Durant, who was a nursery business owner and worked all his whole career in nurseries. And now he works for one of my sponsors called Arbor Green, selling products. So he already knows everything that the industry needs. He's able to sell products to um, businesses. He can speak their language. He can also advise on, you know, the sort of products that the company needs to buy that he might be like, these look great on the surface, but nursery folk won't go for them because ABC, they got pink coloring on them and they, and we like green coloring, whatever it is, he can sort of provide that um, feedback. Obviously that was an oversimple, like nobody cares about pink or green, but you get kind of get the point. He might say, no, no, yeah. <laughs> totally. His industry expertise, you can't buy yeah. that, right? Like you can't, that decade of experience is really important. Um, that's very interesting. So sales could be an interesting pivot while you're even in the industry, just wanting to get out, or it's an interesting way to kind of move into the, in. You also have education on your list of, of, so obviously education is going to be something that you're only doing after you're very qualified and you have hopefully multiple degrees because you should know what you're doing when you teach people. I wouldn't even say multiple degrees. Most TAFE teachers in Australia only teach to the level that they are at. So let's say I've got to a Cert 3 level. I can teach up to a Cert 3 level. Okay. So you only need to have a, at least as much education as the students you're teaching, but you also need to have shown that you're still in the industry and you haven't let it slide away. Okay. Interesting. So, and is that teaching at the university level? Like, what does that look like, really? In the article, I'm specifically talking about to a trade qualification level. So I'm not talking about botany or um, even teaching horticulture at a university level. What I'm talking about is at TAFE, which in Australia is our tertiary education. It's our trade qualification. So it's run by the government. I'm not sure what the equivalent is in the US, but this is probably where my knowledge of education in the US probably leaves. Us. I think I can fact check with my friend who's Leslie, who's been here for a while. I can fact check and put put the answer in the show notes. But this is interesting. So you're saying educating other industry professionals, like literally teaching the class that you got certified in, you can turn around and teach it to other people who also need that certification. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Got it. Very cool. And then last but not least, something you and I both do now, and a lot of people listening might be very interested in getting into that might be low-hanging fruit for them, is media and content creation. Plantfluencers is a term. I get introduced as a plantfluencer now. It makes me cringe a little bit, but that's a thing. Every business needs content. And so therefore, every horticulture business also needs content. So you could become a content creator for a business in the horticulture industry that you respect. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I interviewed a buddy of mine from Scotland, Scott Smith, recently about his new role as a BBC presenter for Beechgrove Garden. So he's in traditional media. You can be in you know, get paid for social media. You can get paid for podcasting. There are just so many different pathways. But I think if you're going to take the media route, most of us, and I think you'd probably agree with this, we do a lot of free work on social media or a podcast or a YouTube channel. And we do that for years for free while we, one, hone our craft. Secondly, we build an audience. And an audience is not a way to make money it, well, an audience is not a source of money. It's a way to monetize. It's not like I have a thousand followers and then I say, well, I get $1 for every follower. It's like, no, I, I got to make a product or sell advertising spaces. Or for me, I built a job board and I, I also found another job. And hope that maybe 10% of your audience converts. Maybe if you're lucky. Yeah. 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 If you're very lucky. That's where the sales and marketing comes in again. That's two very different things. But you've got to have both the sales and marketing if you're going to be a solopreneur, don't you? Definitely. I think especially in the pandemic, we saw so many people all of a sudden just decide that they were plant influencers and plant experts. 
and make an Instagram account or make content around it. I think if you want to be a full-time content creator in the horticulture industry, you have to be committed to your education. I feel like I've seen so many people just like get online, start teaching, quote unquote, these things that are not true because they saw a viral video about it and then they just replicated. And I just think if you want to have longevity in the industry, you have to be committed to your own education and the quality of content that you're creating for the people that are consuming it. I've been doing this for seven years and I feel like I've seen so many people kind of come and go and burn out. And I just, I think if you want to be your own kind of plant entrepreneur, plant fluencer, whatever, like you have to be committed to your education and the high quality education for your audience. I couldn't agree more. I think it's just so wrong when you see, if you get it wrong, that's one thing. But someone like Five Minute Crafts who are putting out stuff that intentionally is misrepresenting how it grows. So like I saw one, oh, some of them are so bad. I interviewed Dr. Vikram Beluga on my TikTok plant fails episode. And he was talking about how they have like dry noodles as roots just to show you that it's growing. And they're just fast forwarding through the whole process and just making something that looks good, but it's really sending people in the wrong direction. Next thing you know, you've got people using orange juice to water their plants and milk to, to get rid of diseases indoors and just all of this oversimplified. So it's like, they'll be like, oh, bananas have potassium. So put your banana peels on your garden. Banana water. Yeah, banana water, all of that stuff. Water your plants with banana water. And I can't tell you how many like of my friends who are well-meaning, like who are not in the plant space, like people I grew up with, will send me those banana water videos being like, this is so cool. You have to interview this guy or like you have to try this. And I'm just like, oh, I don't have the heart to just like rip into them right now. But I think planty fake news is a real thing. And I think, you know, we have to be not the arbiters of it, but we have to be mindful. And then can you speak a little bit to what you do as a content creator for another brand? So you're not building your own brand with your full-time content creator job. You're working for another brand. So what, what, how is that an option for people? Well, these jobs are pretty special. Like they don't come around very often. So how I did it was I built my own audience on social media. I built my audience writing articles, built my audience for my podcast. Then I've met a whole heap of different people like my mentor, Karen Smith, who is the editor for the Hort Journal magazine. So all of a sudden, this guy is looking for um, what he calls a consultant role, but really it's content creation with a little bit of consulting on the side. And so he asks the, the Hort Journal's publisher, Gabe, oh, do you know anyone? He goes, oh, probably Daniel. And he's like, yeah, yeah, righto check out Daniel's job board, put it on there. And Daniel will be really good at it too. Okay, righto. Then he comes to the Australian Institute of Horticulture and he asks them. And then that email ends up on my desk because I'm the careers guy at the Australian Institute of Horticulture. So I answer him, probably me. Um, I'm probably the only one who can do it (laughs) that I know. And then I just keep popping up in front of him. So I think for a career in horticulture media, I think you need to be on social media. I think you need to be taking your marketing seriously and your branding seriously. Like, who are you and what do you stand for? So I'm the industry guy. So that's what I decided that that's what I stand for. Um, I create content for our industry and I help people get into the industry. That's my whole personal brand. So that's a long-winded way of saying it's about a billion different things. Yeah. 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 And (laughs) what do you create for this other brand? So I do a lot of SEO articles. I do video content creation for them. I turn those into shorts. So he had his own editor and um, who was creating videos for him before. I really wanted to go in my own direction with it. And he was happy enough to let me um, hire my own video editors from a place called Upwork, if you know what that is. Yeah, yeah, I know Upwork. So that's how I find talent and get help with things that I need help with. Just basically hiring freelancers from overseas. It's particularly where the currency conversion works in my favor. So my wife has a wedding invitation business where she sells a lot to the US and the currency conversion works out in her favor because you guys pay more money because your your dollar is better than us. Mm-hmm. So um, it looks like less money to you, whereas right. in Australia, it looks like more money. Yeah. So for me, when I'm hiring overseas talent, it works out better for me because my dollar goes further for them because they see $1 of mine, they go, that looks like more than what it looks like to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's cost of living. It's a, it's a whole whole thing. That's super interesting though. So 
Yeah, I just think that's a very cool underutilized opportunity too. If you, I mean, it sounds like you kind of got this job as because you built your own brand. But I think that there are a lot of companies in the plant space that need people who know how to shoot and edit videos. They don't even need to be in the videos, but they need people to be able to do that. They need people to be able to write, you know, properly sourced, properly cited, not fake news blogs about plant care. Like they need content. Everybody needs content now. And if you have expertise that you can leverage, if you have a history of caring for plants that you can leverage and a commitment to making sure that you're sharing proper stuff and continuing your education, maybe you can even get this company to continue to pay to continue your education as you continue to create content for them. Like there's so many interesting things that you can do that, you know, you don't have to start an Instagram account and become a plant fluencer to be a content creator and media person in the space. I just think it's super interesting. And I've seen a couple of brands that I follow start utilizing that in an interesting way. You're so knowledgeable. I think anybody who's interested in getting into the horticulture industry should definitely go listen to your podcast. It's so fun to interview another podcaster who is in the space, but does something totally different than me. So can you tell people where they can find your podcast, find your socials? And then if you're in Australia and you're interested in maybe finding a job in the hort space where you can find your board. Absolutely. So search Plants Grow Here on any of your favorite listening apps, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, all the good ones, you'll find Plants Grow Here there. It's got a green logo, so you can't miss it. So you can search for my Twitter uh, or my Instagram by searching at Plants Grow Here. I'm not that consistent with posting on them, particularly Instagram, but I am on LinkedIn pretty regularly. So just search Daniel Fuller LinkedIn or Daniel Fuller Hort People or Daniel Fuller Plants Grow Here. I'll turn up. My job board, hortpeople.com. It's free to put up a resume. Employers can get notified when people put up a resume that hits their boxes. So they, you might even get offered a job pretty quickly. It just depends on how your resume looks. Also, employers, it's very affordable to get on there as an employer. I'm not trying to rip anyone off with it. I'm really just trying to provide a solution for our staff shortage crisis because my last employer before I became a content creator full-time was through COVID. He he had to give up hundreds of clients just because the staff weren't there to fill them and, and it was really devastating. And I just don't want to see businesses failing just because of staff. So that's really what this is for. It, that is definitely an issue in the States as well. And um, yeah, I mean, what better job, what better opportunity then to go to a greenhouse every day for work and live in that experience. So everybody go check Daniel out. We'll link to everything in the show notes. It was so nice to connect with you. Thank you for waking up early to hang out with me. And at my time, it's time for dinner now. I got to log off and and go have some dinner. (laughs) Oh, well, enjoy. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was such a fun talk. He's so awesome. If you're interested in learning more about the horticulture industry, you can always go check out his podcast, Plants Grow Here. We'll link to his article online as well. If this episode gets you inspired, let me know. Let me know what is the most appealing job for you and what you might be pursuing. I wanted just to give another shout out to the New York Botanical Garden. That's where I've gotten so much of my horticulture education and also the UCLA online programs that Leslie Halleck is still teaching. So those are two educational options for that have been incredible for me that I highly recommend. And special shout out to so many of the listeners of this podcast that already are in the horticulture space. I know we have plant shop owners who listen to the show. We have growers who listen to the show. We have owners and operators of plant brands listening to the show. So I think it's so cool that there are people in the hort industry that that show up to growing joy with plants as part of our community. I hope this episode was as informative and interesting as it was for me. And until next time, my sweet plant friend, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. 
First, there's the plant parent personality test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.